Hello, I'm Donald McCauley and welcome to MedicsVoices.com where we talk to the key opinion leaders in health and medicine around the world. Today I'm talking to Raj, well his full name is Rajagopal, but he tells me his surname is unpronounceable and he's known around the world by his Christian name. Raj, tell me about your life. You started off as an anesthesiologist, but you finished up in a very different world altogether. It's not uh, really, it's not all that different, Donald. <laughs> Think of uh, all medical specialties. Only two of them took birth to relieve suffering. Everything else is concentrated on diseases, cure, microbes, tumors, things. Not anesthesiology, not palliative medicine. They are very related. <laughs> Uh, anesthesiology took birth primarily to relieve pain during surgery and palliative care relieves pain and suffering throughout life. One of your big interests now is trying to make people aware of palliative care throughout the world. 61 million people, you tell me. I would focus on 51 of those 61 the 10 in generally in Euro-American countries is vastly different. The kind of treatment people there get, the kind of suffering that they have are very different. Whereas this 51 million go through such suffering that it is unbelievable. So, uh, I was looking at some uh, literature, you know, all our guidelines and uh, publications, everything is treatment schedules are dependent on available evidence. Okay. 84% of the people live in low and middle income countries. From where in the field of palliative care, the number of scientific publications have been about 5.5%. Everything is from that 15% of the world and that brings out 94.5% of the publications and all processes, treatment, everything is dependent on that evidence. So much so, sometimes I believe we, we destroy health by providing health care. That's a, that's, a, that's a big statement, but I don't know I'm taking responsibility for that statement. I'm happy to explain why I think so. Health is officially defined as physical, social, and mental well-being. That is not defined as absence of disease or infirmity. In fact, the definition says it is not only absence of disease or infirmity, but physical, social, and mental well-being. Why do I say that uh, healthcare does not provide healthcare? Leave alone physical, mental and social well-being, even physical suffering is not relieved by healthcare systems in low and middle income countries. Where in India, it is estimated that less than 4% of the people get even basic pain relief. Imagine the surgeon cutting open your upper abdomen or chest no pain relief. Nowhere near adequate pain relief. You get a fracture. Imagine what life will be without pain relief. And then imagine cancer. Where pain can be beyond your imagination. Imagine somebody who has been an asthmatic all life. Eventually coming to his or her end of life. The feeling of not being able to take in air and get imagine not getting treated for that. You get treated for the disease. 
not for the breathlessness but that's uh, not improving health but um, let me point out two things one 55 million indians went below poverty line by catastrophic health expenditure more than 4% of our population in one year. The medical science that we learn from your country, we apply here. What about the health? Physical, social and mental well-being, what joke? Destroyed. Very recently, even more recently, an oncologist, three oncologists published a paper studying their patients in three states in India. 52% of people with cancer are subjected to catastrophic health expenditure. Healthcare, destroying health. That's what I meant. But final point. How about the people who are dying? In your country, 90% of people on life support systems are taken off life support systems if treatment is considered futile and then they are given palliative care, allowed to die like human beings. You will find this hard to believe. In our country, we where we cannot afford to do that things like that, once they are on life support systems, 70% of people are continued on life support systems till the heart stops. The other 30% well, are, are maybe taken off life support systems and sent home with a bag for the family member to squeeze in. Cruelty, absolute cruelty and torture of the dying. But this is what happens when we blindly apply Western medicine in our context. So my first point was suffering is not treated. My second point is financial and physical suffering are added and mental suffering are added by irrational end-of-life care. So for the 51 million people, in low- and middle-income countries, what can we do? We, we are not visible. We are not heard. I think that's the basic requirement. Two Lancet Commission reports. One uh, was in 2017. The Lancet Commission report on access to palliative care when it was published, Richard Horton, the editor of the Lancet Group, uh, said medicine will never be the same again. But that is in scientific publications, very much read and reported in the palliative care ecosystem. But, but it needs to go out to the people. Second is the Richard Smith's uh, and Libby Solno's Lancet Commission report on the value of death. And one major recommendation there is we need death literacy. Over two or three generations, we have become death illiterate. Once we switch from joint families to nuclear families, death became a stranger to be feared and avoided. We don't know. We have to bring that back as a part of life, the inevitable consequence of life. Helping people to go through that pain phase with as much of dignity and comfort as possible. Receiving love, giving love. That's precisely what medicine is preventing now when they shut people up in intensive care units and submit them to rigorous imprisonment and torture till death. 
you explore these in your book. I, I love the title of your book. I thought I had a story to tell. I had a story to tell particularly to healthcare students, but also to the person on the street. So I started putting in my thoughts and I thought I had a message to convey. And uh, that's why I came to write the book. The title, Walk with the Weary, that's a lovely title. It really talks very lovingly about palliative care and caring for those who are very seriously ill. When someone has an incurable disease and the hospital thinks that there's nothing more they can do about it, if they are not seen as the people out of whom money can be squeezed in, squeezed out by the medical system, they will be told there will be there is nothing more we can do. Take him, go home. I that was rejecting. That was total rejection. That doctor has treated her for 30 years. And finally, when the person needs that doctor most, she is told, there is nothing more that I can do. You go home. No, at that a time of great suffering. And when you are most weary and need a hand to hold, think, if we accept that medical professionals are more than professionals and they are also human beings. If we accept that, then we will feel the need to hold that hand and walk with the person in the direction that the person wants to travel. Not in the direction that uh, my medical science tells the person to travel so that he or she can live for three days more. But if the person says, I really don't care about that, but before I go, I do want to visit this temple. I do not want to die here. Take me home. And the travel may be risky, but that travel is so important. So, but he can go to that, to go on that journey only if we make him physically comfortable, take away the pain, take away the breathlessness, those things that cloud the mind and do not permit people to live as human beings. Take those away, but walk with that person as long as the person wants the hand held. In another interview, you described another condition, I guess, and that was the malady of loneliness. What does that mean? I have not worked in a Euro-American country, except for a few weeks of training or something like that. But what little I see tells me that the direction that we are also going to is one of a great malady of loneliness about which there is no chapter in any medical textbook. There is no chapter on dignity. There is no chapter on loneliness. Because dignity cannot be measured because on, on, a, on, a, on a dignitometer, Loneliness cannot be seen on an MRI scan and it cannot be treated expensively. I think, uh, I, th I suspect that in your country that malady could be even more than in my country. Here, at least the poor 
can die with the hand held, a kiss on the cheek, and a few drops of water pouring down the throat, poured down the throat. Whereas, uh, in our country, the rich men uh, do not get that. They get only a suction catheter down a tube. Uh, but I suspect that there's a lot of loneliness out there. I suspect that I have seen in hospices just endless rows of lonely people lying there. That is sad. That's, that's not really human. We are not made to be to be lonely. We are social beings. We need company. We need our hands held. We need a finger to wipe the tear. Now, I know you're a very modest man, but I'd like to finish up by asking you about the no many awards you've received, uh, your nomination for a Nobel Peace Prize. Tell me about that experience. Difficult question. Uh, it's a question of a fight with own ego. I, I was very happy to get each and every one of them. Mike Hill and Sue Hill, the couple from Australia, created a movie called The Hippocratic. And uh, that was very great for my ego, of course. But they also had a message to convey, no doubt, huge message. And uh, the India government's Padma Shri is a national award which opened doors for me. Being a Padma Shri awardee does open doors. Uh, but I, in addition, it's also, I, mean, I feel I'm very proud to carry those awards around. Uh, thank you for asking the question. But honestly, the biggest award that I got, I have a photograph of a child with a cancer in the kidney giving me a kiss a couple of days before she died. Truly, someday when, when I am lying in a bed, I suspect that those awards will may not mean so much, but that kiss would still be precious for me. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. You really left us with a legacy of reflection. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.